Hello, it's a privilege to speak at your annual meeting. I appreciate the invitation initially from Osvander Lech, as well as the committee. This topic is on subscapularis tendon tears, and I'll talk about aspects of what I've learned and what's important to me. These are my disclosures, which are all, also available on the AAOS website. I've uh, been to Brazil a couple of times and I'm very fond of visiting there, uh, particularly at Isacos, where I learned about the uh, rich nature of shoulder and shoulder surgery in Brazil. Regarding subscapularis tears, they are not rare, as has been suggested by some other authors. In preparing for a talk in uh, July of this year, I looked at consecutive cases in the first part uh, of 2021. These were 58 consecutive rotator cuff repairs, 51 of the posterior superior cuff, and seven for the subscapularis. So of these 58 cases, 20 or 34% including sub included a subscapularis repair. If we just remove the isolated tears, one-fourth of my posterior superior repairs had a subscapularis repair. This is consistent with a poster presentation at the ASES meeting 15 years ago that I gave, as well as a recent publication by Felsch in this way. I also noted that all 20 subscapularis tears had biceps pathology, which is what we would expect. I learned a lot about finding a subscapularis tear from J.P. Warner, and we've all learned a lot from Christian Gerber. The key is to look for it before surgery. There are some physical exam findings such as increased sectional rotation, a positive weak belly press, an abnormal liftoff and modified liftoff. And we also know the association with biceps and posterior superior cuff. So when those are suspected, also look for the subscapularis. Imaging can be helpful. Radiographs, not so much, although I have submitted an abstract to a radiology meeting about a finding, which is always uh, associated with subscapularis tear, and I call this an os subscapulari, which is seen here on x-ray, as well as can be detected on MRI. This is what it looks like arthroscopically in a right shoulder, and these are easily repaired arthroscopically. MRI has been very helpful, and due to the time limits, I'll confine my comments to the coronal view. This is a posterior superior tear, but if we come anteriorly a few cuts, we'll see a couple of interesting things. One is the space medial to the coracoid. I call this a medial coracoid sign because normally there should be no space. The muscle should abut the coracoid. We can also see a vertical uh, biceps, which is dislocated medially, which uh, suggests subscapularis pathology, as well as on this 2009 MRI, the comma tissue. And the comma tissue will be a common theme. Let's look at this patient. Again, here's the tear. If we, a couple, if we go a couple cups forward, we can see the comma tissue. And then we look at it arthroscopically. This is what we see when we enter the joint in this right shoulder from posterior. If we advance the scope and go medial to the comma tissue, we see the rolled edge of the subscapularis. And when we pull on the comma tissue, we can see the extent of the tendon. Some other aspects of preoperative imaging, there's a perched uh, biceps, which we can also see here, as well as bony pathology. However, you can detect this on the coronal view. Some arthroscopic points. Again, the comma tissue. With a subscapularis tear, you wanna look for it. I'm retracting the biceps out of the way, and here I see the comma tissue. And then when you pull on the comma tissue, you can see the extent of the subscapularis. Another thing I look for is the middle glenohumeral ligament. Normally, it's at or lateral to the uh, glenoid surface here in a right shoulder. And here also in a right shoulder, which has a non-displaced subscapularis tear. Here's the comma tissue. I'm retracting the subscapularis laterally to reveal the middle glenohumeral ligament. When I don't see it laterally, I'm more likely to repair it. And now I know the extent of the retraction and where I'm gonna to need to repair it to. And this is the repair in external rotation. 
Visualization. There are ways to improve this. This is a right shoulder, and I can't really see the lesser tuberosity well, but when I flex the arm, I can. I use a 30 degree scope, but I really don't use a 70 degree scope in my cases. When I wanna look down the subscapularis, I can view from the lateral portal. This is part of the releases. The middle glenohumeral ligament is being released here as it is in every case, and then I'm gonna release around the subscapularis, anteriorly, superior, and posteriorly to the base of the coracoid. This enables me to get the most excursion I can for the subscapularis prior to my repair. Internal rotation can reveal the extent of partial tears as well. I like using a traction stitch. It's a very simple step. You place a spinal needle from anterior lateral along the rolled edge, and then through that spinal needle uh, location, you can retrieve a monofilament suture. I'll show that here. This is in a right shoulder. I come in with a crescent type hook, pass a number one PDS suture. I'll make a stab incision where the spinal needle was. I'll retrieve both limbs of the PDS suture and then pull on it. And I use this when I do releases as well as when I'm tying. Here's the external view. I like to maintain the comma tissue in all cases. When you pull on it, you can see retracting the subscapularis laterally, and after releases, there's the comma tissue. And then after the releases, you get even greater excursion, where now I'm able to pull it entirely over the lesser tuberosity. But it does an interesting thing. It also brings the posterior superior tear more laterally, which will make for an easier repair. And that's because the comma tissue has been maintained. Here's the uh, construct uh, before I did a repair and after I repaired the subscapularis. Now you can do a single or double row into the supraspinatus and infraspinatus tear and you get a nice secure repair. And the essential feature is the comma tissue. If you don't repair the subscapularis this, and do a posterior superior repair, you're more likely to get a re-tear as you're only closing the zipper halfway. When you do repair the subscapularis first, it brings the supraspinatus more laterally and you'll be able to achieve a more secure repair. And that's because of the comma tissue. And Steve Burkhart and I described this about a decade ago. Anchor insertion, I've learned a couple tips here. Uh, for 100% tear, you always start with the inferior one. And here I'm going percutaneous. These are the steps. I'm using a metal anchor in this case, which I still use on occasion. Here's the external view with the sutures. But there are times where I can go through a cannula, again, staying lateral to the subscapularis, now with the anchor in place. But times you have to go through the rotator interval medial to the comma tissue. So there's a little bit of flexibility required here. Suture passage. This is how the subscapularis avulses on this approximate angle. Here you can see that ossicle I talked about earlier. So that's how I want to pass my sutures in this same alignment. I like using a retrograde shuttling technique where I bring a crescent hook about one and a half centimeters medial to the lateral edge of the subscapularis and about two centimeters inferior to the rolled edge for my first pass. I'll shuttle this through. And then after I shuttle all the sutures from each anchor, I'll then tie with the arm in internal rotation pulling on the traction stitch for a single row repair. And this is a uh, repair shown here with two anchors. When I use metal anchors exclusively, I was able to show you the anchor position and you can see them here. Triple load anchors have afforded a couple of other options. With a 50% tear, I can use one triple loaded anchor. Also, I don't tend, I, I don't remove the lateral scar tissue because I can go through it. This is here showing passing the lateral repair sutures after I've already passed the medial sutures. And then once they're through, I'll then tie those knots to secure the subscapularis onto the prepared bow to the less tuberosity in a, a good secure fashion. So I'll give one example of a full thickness subscapularis tear of the upper 50 to 60% and a repair. Here's the uh, MRI view showing the tear, the fluid we talked about, and the biceps here is perched. 
This is what it looks like arthroscopically, again, perched on the medial aspect of the groove in this right shoulder. I'll pull back and you can see the tear here. I did a two portal technique with one triple loaded anchor in a near anatomic repair, and here's the patient at seven months. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about Hinton lesions. These are um, more involving pathology of the biceps, although sometimes you do repair the subscapularis. Here you can see the damage that it can cause to the biceps tendon. And here is how they sublux into that hidden lesion and tear. But this could be a whole nother talk. So some principles. There are diagnostic findings on the exam, as well as on the MRI, as I show here, for the bone and biceps, as well as identifying the subscapularis tear and its retraction. At arthroscopy, in this left shoulder, when you view, you want to look for the comma tissue, go medial to it, retract it laterally to reveal the middle glenohumeral ligament to help you understand the tear extent and where you need to repair to. I do my repairs in the beach chair position from a glenohumeral approach, and I find that uh, the traction stitch can be very helpful. I like retrograde suture passing, as you can see here, in a single row repair construct. Here's that repair, and then I go on and repair the posterior superior cuff tear, either single row or double row, it almost doesn't matter because you've reduced the stress on the posterior superior tear and here at four and a half months out. Thank you very much.